hello, everybody. I, I hope I hope you can hear me. It's uh, before all. I just want to say it's uh, it, it's absolutely a pleasure to to be really the opening speaker for this very exciting online seminar series uh, uh, organized by this uh, really really exciting new center uh, sponsored by the NSF. Uh, when when uh, when Dr. Batiste first got in touch with me on on giving this lecture, I thought, well, you know, I can tell you a lot about the mechanochemistry research we do in our group, but but maybe I want to make it, you know, a, a, a slightly bit broader. Uh, maybe maybe try to address not only our work but also some recent contemporary work by other groups address some re relevant uh, problems which are emerging in modern mechanochemistry and maybe try to connect what we now know and what we are interested in in mechanochemistry connected to, to, to some time, a long time ago. So uh, as you can see, I'm, uh, I'm uh, based at McGill University in Montreal in Canada. And the picture you see on the slide is uh, definitely not how Montreal looks right now. We're going to be snowed in, but you know, probably only a couple of months. And uh, I would like to start this by, before all, uh, thanking uh, the people who do really all the work in my group, which is a bunch of really exciting and excited, talented and dynamic students and postdocs, sometimes professors. Uh, we do a lot of different things, and something that really brings us together is the desire to, to advance this area of solvent-free, green, and environmentally friendly chemistry, which I, I would say is beautifully and perfectly embodied in, in mechanochemistry. But before we go into talking about mechanochemistry, I'd like to ask a fundamental question, and that is really, what is chemistry? And, and the truth is that uh, since this is a, a very, very general lecture series, and it is really oriented to, well, anybody who connects on YouTube, so not only uh, trained chemistry physicists, uh, probably for most people watching this channel, if they're not chemists, the, question, the, the answer would be, chemistry is something done by folks like this guy here. So the guy with frizzy hair, with lots of solvents, lots of beakers, and obviously, you know, I, I nicked this slide, it's from a, from a Hollywood B movie, uh, we not, unfortunately cannot see colors, but you know how people represent chemists. It's always going to be green and yellow and, and, and red liquids and so on. So this is an image of chemistry. This is an image of, of chemists that have that has really become very deeply ingrained in the popular culture. And you may say, well, you're exaggerating a bit, but here, let me, let me highlight another thing. Uh, let's ask what is chemistry? Not not chemists, not 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 the popular crowd, but but let's ask Wikipedia, the you know the the, the world's largest depository of information. And I don't want you to read this Wikipedia page. All I did here was I typed in chemistry, and this is what I got. And you know, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And and here you see, chemistry is nothing else but a bunch of liquids and flasks and beakers. And, and, you know, that's not really a, a big deal. It's not really a problem if you are doing chemistry on a very small scale. But on a large scale, the use of solvents is a continuous issue because most solvents tend to be toxic, they tend to be volatile, they tend to be flammable, typically organic liquids. And, and working on, on scales of millions of tons of annually industrially means the production of a large, large amount of toxic waste. So an alternative to using solvents in chemistry, which I will try to convince you in this presentation, is mechanochemistry. The term mechanochemistry may sound cool to people who just got into the field, like something relatively new, like a brand new buzzword, but it's actually been around for, well, at this point, over a century. The, the term mechanochemistry is thought to have been introduced by nobody else but the famous uh, German physical organic chemist Wilhelm Ostwald, who in his textbook of chemical sciences of in the turn of the 18th of the 19th to 20th century, tried to divide chemical reactivity into different classes based on the type of energy input. 
So he, 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 he considered reactions driven by heat, which is most reactions that people perform in the lab and industry these days as thermochemistry, reactions driven by electrical energy, electrochemistry, reactions driven by radiation, for example, radiochemistry. And in his list, he also included the idea and some examples of chemical reactions induced by mechanical force. These he termed mechanochemistry. And it turns out, I would say that mechanochemistry is maybe among these, one of the simplest ones to perform because all you need to perform mechanochemistry is a mortar and pestle, and then you can do manual grinding and you can achieve chemical transformations. It sounds very easy, uh, but it's also terribly reproducible. So what I'll try to illustrate in this talk, also the switch that has been happening in mechanochemistry over the last several decades from simply grinding something together in the laboratory to performing ball milling operations, which can be done in automated ball mills, which means that you have very controllable environments. They are done in, we call them capsules, we call them jars, essentially vessels which are fully enclosed and in which you have your starting materials packed together with something that's called milling media, typically, typically, uh, uh, typically uh, different size balls or stones and so on. And that's illustrated on this slide as neat grinding. You take your starting materials, they can be solids, but they can also be liquids or gases if you wish. And, and you put them in this vessel, this milling jar, and then they are being shaken left and right by a ball mill, typically a shaker mill, in the presence of this milling media. The motion of the milling media creates impact and shear, which eventually leads to chemical reactivity and transformations. Now, when one performs ball milling like this, chemical reactions can happen, or maybe not. And in that case, when chemical reactions do not happen, uh, well, the typical alternative is let's grind harder. Let's use, uh, you know, bigger balls, heavier balls. Let's 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 shake this mill faster. And, and this is something that we generally consider to be a not a terribly intelligent solution for a problem. Uh, being chemists, being researchers, we like to find maybe more elegant ways to deal with problems of using or controlling chemical activity. And a trick that has emerged over the last couple of decades is known as liquid assisted grinding. It sounds a bit like cheating. It has to do with having a very small amount of a liquid phase. Typically, stoichiometrically, similar or actually even lower than the amount of your reactants. So you're not talking here about either a slurry or a solution. You're talking about something much, much thicker. And, and it turns out that the addition of this very small amount of liquid can induce chemical reactivity where they used to be not, or it can be used to accelerate chemical reactions and enable optimization. Or even better, in some cases, uh, it can lead to different reaction pathways. Now, before I really get into the nitty gritty of mechanochemistry, I also wanna highlight, and I'll occasionally do that through this brief talk, a few contributions of, of, of other groups. And I must say that for me, a big inspiration in mechanochemistry since my graduate school days was the work of the Braga group. So Professor Dario Braga, Lucia Maini, Fabrizia Grepioni, based at the University of Bologna. And that group has over the last two decades done some very fundamental, very inspiring uh, research in mechanochemistry. So I strongly invite you to check out the recent papers and see what they have been up to for the last several decades. Now, I mentioned liquid assisted grinding. Liquid assisted grinding is really a evolvement of a methodology introduced by the Braga group, which is known as needy, essentially grinding in the presence of continuously supplemented liquid. And, and the way we look at liquid assisted grinding, we look at it as, a, as only one in a whole spectrum of different chemical reaction techniques which are mediated by a liquid. And, and to illustrate that, we introduced a parameter which we call which we call eta, and and that is nothing else but the ratio of the volume of the added liquid in your system to the weight of the actual reactants. So at very high eta values, so lots of liquid per reactant, you have classical chemistry in solution. If you go below that. So if eta values would be typically between two or 10 or 12 microliters per milligram, you, you, you deal with slurries, chemical systems, which are suspensions, they can be fairly thick, but you can still stir them. And importantly, in those systems still, 
you see the effects of solubility, which means that if one of your starting materials is poorly soluble, it will not react very well. But if you reduce the amount of liquid even further, so you go be below, let's say, empirically stated two microliters per milligram, you get into this magic zone of liquid assisted grinding or black. And it turns out that under these conditions, at least in the very few studies that have been conducted so far, uh, there seems to be no or very little dependence of reactivity on the solubility of the starting materials in the liquid atmosphere. So you have now this very interesting environment, which is essentially a solid uh, imbued with some of the liquid phase that, that accelerates chemical reactions, that can direct them or template them even, but at the same time, one does not suffer apparently from the, 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 the influence of, of, of thermodynamic solubility of reactants. And obviously, if you reduce the amount of liquid even further, you go down to zero. You're talking about dry or neat grinding. And these days, people are very much interested in what is the nature of the liquid phase in the lag environment. And, and very recently, it was shown that actually the lag environment can be seen as a, as, as a catalytic system, where the liquid not necessarily plays the role of a solvent, because there is too little of it, but actually a catalyst. Now, one can observe these liquid effects uh, in real time using methodologies, which I mentioned later on, by, by real time monitoring of mechanochemical processes. And here is a, a, a example of that work uh, reported by, by our group, uh, in which we are observing what happens by meat milling of two pharmaceutically relevant molecules. One of them is saccharine, the other one is a drug called carbamazepine. And if you mill them dry, uh, what you see here is a change in the X-ray diffraction signal over time of milling. You can see it just goes down, which means the material is losing crystallinity, it's becoming amorphous. But if you perform exactly the same experiment, but with the addition of a small amount of liquid, at the values of typically 0.25 microliters per milligram or so, you see immediately the drop in the signal of the uh, co-crystal components, saccharine carbamazepine, and the appearance of crystalline material, a co-crystal of these two. So this is a really nice real-time observation of reactivity in organic solid set, solid set systems, <coughs> excuse me, that has been induced and enabled through, through, through liquid system mechanochemistry. And again, these experiments are done typically using X-ray diffraction at different synchrotrons. So for example, if one is interested in such experiments, they can be performed at the DAISY synchrotron in, in, in Hamburg or the BAM system in Berlin. Also, the Pavel Scher Institute in, in Switzerland has a system dedicated to such work. Um, and the first experiments on this were done at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, so ESRF in Grenoble. And, and, and usually, this work does not involve only a single person, as usually it is with synchrotrons, but a number of groups and collaborations. So our group, for example, very often works with, with groups based in Institut Ruja Broskovic in Croatia, uh, groups based, in, uh, based in, in, in Stuttgart, led by Robert Dinebier, and so on. Um, what else does this liquid do? As I said, this liquid is the grinding really is like magic. And, and for me personally, maybe one of the most impressive examples of this magic, and also really relevant in the context of pharmaceutical materials, is the ability to interconvert crystalline forms, polymorphs, of organic molecules by, by, by milling in the presence of different liquids. So here is a classical piece of work reported by the Jones Group. Uh, at this point, 15 years ago, we have shown that milling anthermilic acid in one polymorphic form, let's say with heptane, leads to polymorph two. Milling it further with chloroform leads to form three. Milling form three with water, for example, leads to form one, and so on. So, so this opportunity to selectively and deliberately cycle between polymorphs is very exciting, and, and at this point is uniquely offered by the alchemical reaction environment. Obviously, a tremendous importance in pharmaceutical materials development. There is a vast surge of interest in mechanochemistry these days. And I just want to highlight here very briefly that I'm not only terribly happy to see the foundation of this NSF Center for, for the Mechanical Control Chemistry, but also I would like to highlight that this center now exists in parallel with a maybe a similar establishment in the EU, the European Union Cost Action on Mechanochemistry, which is coordinated by 
Professor Lucia Maini at the University of Bologna and Evelina Colacino based on the University of Montpellier. And I just wanted to highlight that last year, at least one type of mechanochemistry, mean screw extrusion was highlighted actually by IUPAC one of them is one of the ten, top 10 technologies, chemical innovations that will or could change the world. So this is really globally very interesting time for mechanochemistry. But we did not invent mechanochemistry. Uh, mechanochemistry has been around for a long time. If you really think about it, making things by grinding or milling or shard shape shearing or rubbing things together has been around for a long time. Uh, we, we usually imagine that ancient peoples were making objects, making fire and, and, and you know, pharmaceutical uh, reagents through grinding. This is why still, especially in the UK, if one walks down the street and you walk past the pharmacy, there will be a sign in the form of a, a, a form of a mortar and pestle. So mechanochemical processes have been with us probably much longer than, 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 than there are existing recorded texts. And you can say, well, maybe these guys exaggerate a bit. So show me some references. And my favorite reference is actually a almost 2000 years old book written by Theophrastus of, 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 of Eresos. Uh, he was an ancient Hellenic philosopher who inherited Aristotle's school of, school of philosophy in Athens. And he wrote many books. Many of them did not survive, but one of them definitely did. And in Latin, this one is called De Lapidibus, which translates into On Stones. And, and I really like this book for two reasons. First of all, it's not terribly long, so it's easy to read. Second of all, it really appears, at least to me, as the world's maybe first attempt at the inorganic materials chemistry textbook. Because what Theophrastus did in that book, he tried to put together, illustrate, and describe all sorts of processes known in his ancient world for, 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 for obtaining metals, extracting them from minerals, for processing minerals and ores. This is a really interesting read. And, and, and if you're interested, I, I believe you can still download a PDF from the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, from the library of the Ohio State University. And this PDF of this book shown here contains not only the original text, but also Latin translation and English. So please go for it. Now, what fascinated me in that book was an example of a metal winning procedure. In this case, obtaining mercury metal from a ore, from a mineral known as cinnabarite. We now know, obviously Theophrastus did not, that cinnabarite is mercury sulfide. And also we know that cinnabarite is still, maybe maybe still the least soluble substance known to us. It's an extremely soluble material. And to extract mercury from this mineral, it needs to be converted to more tractable, soluble forms. And, 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 and this is how modern technology works. You have minerals that then you need to dissolve or solubilize in some way and then extract metals. However, 2,000 years ago, Theophrastus describes a process where grinding cinnabarite in the presence of, a, of copper. So for example, in a, in a copper or bronze mortar and pestle, one simply by grinding the mineral, maybe with a little bit of vinegar added without explanation, produces mercury metal. And it turns out that actually this chemistry is real. It replaces the use of harsh dissolving agents by simple grinding, it is a mechanically induced mechanochemical process. It is, we now know, a chemical reaction. It's a redox process between copper, from which the mortar is made of, and mercury sulfide, in which copper gets oxidized and mercury gets reduced to oxidation state zero, elementary metal. So for me, this is a wonderful illustration still of what mechanochemistry can do. It can replace a, a harsh process based on the need to resolve, based on very on high temperatures, aggressive reagents, with a with a simple procedure that deals immediately with fully soluble feedstocks. How does mechanochemistry in the lab works? Here we have a movie that was recorded by a visiting undergraduate student and now a graduate student at University of Liverpool, Michael Brand, and and this was report, recorded simply with a with an iPhone and with, with a fisheye lens. And I believe the movie has been slowed down. I can't remember four or ten times. Anyway, in this case, we have a transparent jar made of plastic. Inside, you have a ball made of zirconia, a tough ceramic, and starting materials. In this case, europium chloride, an organic molecule known as dibenzylmethane. And when one places this on a ball mill and shakes at a frequency of 30 hertz, so 30 times left and right oscillations, remember, this is slow motion, 
This is what you see. The sample gets ground and smashed, and even with slow motion, already now the sample has gone thoroughly orange. Chemical reaction happened very quickly. And I like to show this movie because it's pretty, and it also shows how mechanochemical reactions by grinding, although there is really no formal solvent in them, can happen really in a nickel time. They can be fast, they can sometimes be faster than solution reactions. And, and just to show where, for example, we are going with some of the mechanochemistry work is, for example, gold. Gold is something that we are all interested in. People naturally love gold because it's pretty, it's valuable. It's also terribly important for electronics because of its high chemical resistance and conductivity. Now, making gold is really important for modern industries. We would not have our computers, our cell phones, any of the modern electronics without gold conducting wires and systems. Now, what happens with gold, however, after it's been used, that's a different story. How we obtain gold also, it's not so trivial. One can say, well, gold is not reactive. It's simply found in nature. What is the problem? What is the problem mining gold? But it turns out, in order to obtain gold and purify it, just like any other highly noble metal, like palladium or platinum, one needs to first go through metals of classical chemistry, which means we need to dissolve them. And the dissolution of these metals typically involves very nasty reagents. Uh, concentrated nitric and hydrochloric acid in a mixture known as aqua regia, royal water, because it is the only liquid in the ancient times known to dissolve gold, or the use of elementary chlorine, and on and on and on. Now, all of these very harsh treatments eventually convert gold and palladium and platinum to more tractable reagents like chlorpalladates, chloroorates, so water-soluble systems that can then be processed using milder chemistry. But how we get there is truly environmental horror. It requires aquaregia, which you can, you know, stand in the lab, but on very large scales, the use of aquaregia and related chemicals leads to these very nasty tailing bonds, which cause a lot of environmental damage through mining. So what can we do about this? Well, one of the graduate students in my group, Louis Dobb, said, well, this is a problem. How can we address it? And, and, and he tried to see how he can actually activate oxidized gold and platinum and palladium not through aqua regia, but by milling. And these three, three balls here, three circles, are the intergalactic sign for mechanochemistry introduced by the Hanusa group some four or five years ago. And Louis finds that he can simply mill, mill these metals with an oxidant such as oxon. And in the presence of sodium chloride or sodium bromide, he easily makes these chloropalladates, bromoorate systems, which are needed for industry. So he has found a way to produce these dropping chemicals that can be used for further processing of these metals. But the way to make these dropping chemicals now it eliminates the use of native elementary chlorine or aquaregia. And here is an example of Lewis milling jars. Each of these milling jars contained elementary metal. After a brief milling period, it is now pure, well, it's, 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 it's essentially completely converted into chloropalladates, chloroorates, and so on, which, as I said, are fully water soluble. So here is an example of the benefit of metal chemistry that can be used to, pure, to, clean, to clean up an industrial process, simplify, eliminate the need for, for nasty reagents, and, and, and as still be compatible with existing manufacturing procedures. So this is the sort of thing we are very much interested in. We are interested in mechanochemistry as a reaction environment. Not at the same time while we do studies of mechanochemical reactivity, we find very often serendipitously that we are not only greener and cleaner and safer in the way we do chemistry, but we find that new chemical reactions, we can make new molecular fragments, we can sometimes discover new new materials, and so on. And, and this really leads us to the philosophy of, of what we do in my group at McGill, is we are trying to develop what we call chemistry 2.0, which is a, a system of chemical reactivity which tries to avoid solvent. It's based on using solvent-free reactions, such as mechanochemistry, to do all of chemistry. It's really a, it, it's a very ambitious goal, maybe it's never going to work, but, but you know, we are giving it our best try. And here's an example of something we've done almost 10 years ago now, working with then postdoc and now runs his own group in Croatia, Diego Stokstrukel, demonstrating the synthesis of over 50 organic molecules through a mechanochemical reaction. And in each of, each of these cases, not only did liquid assisted grinding allow us to make these molecules in essentially quantitative isolated yield, 
But also in many cases, the products were microcrystal in solids, which means that we could determine crystal structure of those. As shown here, these crystal structures, not by dissolving the sample in solvent and growing crystals, but by powder X-ray diffraction on freshly milled samples. And in addition to X-ray powder diffraction, these samples were all characterized through, for example, solid state NMR, reflectance IR. So we are trying to show how one can combine a really good method to make materials solvent-free with all of these fantastic methodologies out there to analyze materials solvent-free. And one day really develop strategies on how to run a solvent-free research laboratory. Now, this is all interest to, to us academically, but also in ter terms of applications, pharmaceutical industries are really interested in cleaning up their work. Obviously, when one performs pharmaceutical synthesis, if one can eliminate toxic solvents from this process, it can only be for the better. So this is a big driving force for us. And some years ago, we have actually given this overview, even then it was not extensive, of all sorts of drug molecules, acting pharmaceutical ingredients, APIs, which have somehow been modified mechanochemically. And here at the bottom is a small, and now probably tripled or quadrupled in size group of molecules that were actually made through solvent free mechanochemistry. Our little contribution to this was the synthesis of these tolbutamide and related sulfonylurea uh, reagents, which have been known as first and second generation anti diabetic drugs. And, and we have worked with, with Professor Evelina Colacino in Montpellier, who, 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 who enabled this chemistry, this solvent-free approach to making active pharmaceutical ingredients to be implemented actually in an undergraduate teaching lab, which I believe is a fantastic way to teach students how to think differently about chemistry and get them to, to appreciate and get experience with, with green chemistry. And, and these reactions actually led us to discovery of new processes, new coupling reactions between sulfonamides or amides, with carbodimides, isocyanides, chemistry that has, to the best of our knowledge, not really been reported, at least not, 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 not extensively before. And, and one of these reactions which fascinated us was the reaction of sulfonamides with carbodimides, shown here, which, which based on the, on the work we've done, proceeds in most cases very rapidly in very high yields by milling. But if one tries to repeat it in solution under different conditions, we find that chemical reactions of this type either did not happen or they happen at very low conversions, 10%, 50%. So, 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 so I just want to show this as an example of some chemical reactivity that is not impossible, but it's difficult to achieve in solution. But mechanochemically, I would say it's quite trivial to accomplish. Now, we have been expanding our work, you know, beyond gold refinement and, and new reactions towards other more complex systems. And I'm really proud of the work where we joined forces with a group of Masada Dama here at McGill University, showing a mechanochemical solvent free approach to make dimers, trimers, tetramers of DNA and RNA and actually make even further oligomers. So we are really excited about this. Um, I am a big fan of making complex molecules mechanochemically. It's still a very underdeveloped area. And I just want to highlight here one of the works that I really, really appreciate. It was published in 2013 by, by, the, by the Lamati group. And I still think represents a tour de force of solid free synthesis. It is making of leoencephalin a, a pharmaceutically relevant oligopeptide in essentially nine solvent free steps, mechanochemical and thermal. I think it's a great piece of work. Shows that one can really make complex targets chemically. And, and in our group, we have actually joined forces also with Rina Av in Tallinn, uh, together with, with her then graduate student and now postdoc with us, Sandra Campbell, who has actually shown how mechanochemically one can conduct templated, selective, size selective synthesis of microcycles, such as these hemicucubitrials. So there is a lot of potential, and I would say there is very li little limit for mechanochemistry. We have also joined forces with a group of Carino Claire here, who are experts in enzymology, and we developed something that was new for both of us, a solid free approach that uses cellulase enzymes as a way to conduct solid free breakdown of biomass into monomeric saccharides. So in this case, we are able to achieve very, very high yields, very direct conversions of biomass into monosaccharides. This work has very much been run and developed by a former postdoc, Dr. Fabian Hammerer. And, and, and he introduced a methodology and he named the methodology of reactive aging or raging. 
What it means is not ball milling your systems or enzymes until they are low and, and exhausted. What one does is one mills this enzymatic solid mixture for five or 10 minutes, and then lets it sit for a while in an incubated area, maybe over an hour, then bring it back, remill it, re-age, and so on. And this react reactive aging, re aging is able to produce really, really high conversions. In this case, getting almost to complete conversions of, of natural biomass materials like sugarcane bagasse or wheat straw into monosaccharides. So really exciting work that we are now pursuing on this. Now, this idea of doing chemistry by milling and aging brings me back to the story of Theophrastus and his book on stones. Because his book on stones did not only describe a route to make mercury by grinding or milling, well, I guess by grinding, but it also described a methodology to make a white pigment known as lead white. It's not really used much these days because, you know, lead is very toxic. But until the early 20th, the 20, 20th of the 20th century, lead white has been for centuries one of the principal white pigments used by our society. Uh, as a cover paint, as a protective paint, uh, British Navy warships were, were covered with a protective layer of, of, of lead white. It was made in many tens of thousands of tons in the 19th century. Using a process which is known as the Dutch method or the stack process, but it actually is a derivative of something that seems to have been in place, well, definitely at the time of Theophrastus and possibly even before him. This aging process, which I'm showing here uh, in slides that I got from this website here, it's a company that still manufactures small amounts of lead white uh, for art purposes. This process is based on taking metallic lead, sheets of lead, folding them and placing them in an environment filled with essentially horse dung, manure, and, and letting, letting this metal age and rot in the presence of decaying organic matter leads to corrosion. And what you can see on this slide are these folded metallic, metallic uh, sheets. And after several weeks aging in this rotting environment, by the way, brown stuff here is horse dung, they convert to this white material, which can then be removed and, and used. So this is really thousands and thousands old process that demonstrates how one can perform industrially relevant manufacture from insoluble starting materials using solvent-free chemistry. This is very simple. This may not be terribly immediately relevant for pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical manufacture, but I believe it's a wonderful example of how one can take solvent-free chemistry either mechanochemistry or aging, and turn it into a multi-ton scale industrial development process. Now, who in the right mind at this point is making this lead white? Well, you know, if you want to use exactly the same rich, enjoyable pigment, like the masters of the Renaissance, who all use this lead white, you need to use this particular pigment. So there is still a market for, you know, a few hundred kilos a year, of lead white is still being manufactured using the same old method. And I just wanted to highlight this for you. Now, knowing about this method, we started also thinking, well, what else can you do? Maybe, maybe besides mechanochemistry and raging, maybe we can go even simpler. How do we devise a chemical process which is going to be simple, boring as watching paint dry, but at the same time be energetically modest and not require solvents? Well, simply the same thing, aging. So we looked at this and together with a former student and now a CEO of a spin-off company, Axinam, Christina Motillo, we have actually developed methods to convert these mineral-like feedstocks, metal oxides or carbonates, directly into advanced materials known as metalconic frameworks. And all I'm showing you here, maybe the most important thing here is this petri dish. It's filled with, 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 with a material, commercially relevant framework known as Z8. And it was made not by cooking, boiling, distilling. It was made simply by mixing the metal oxide with the right organic molecule, in this case, two methyl imidazole, and letting it age in moist and warm air. You know, one of my colleagues joked, this is just like making Swiss cheese. You mix things up and you let it sit in a warm, moist place. And one day you come and there is something there that it has lots of holes in it. In this case, holes are obviously of nano size. These are micro-porous metal framers. 
But besides these metalgamic frameworks based on zinc and imidazoles, we can also make some really cool materials much more relevant. For example, materials being developed by the Parha Group at Northwestern University, where together with, with our former postdoc, again now a, a leader of a green chemistry laboratory in Croatia, Kronoslav Ujarevic, we have demonstrated that we can make these very stable, catalytically very useful materials, not only by milling, but also by aging. So it's a very simple, very clean, and I would actually say quite time efficient methodology. Now, aging in water vapor can also be replaced by aging in different organic vapors. And, and, and really, this is not something we have invented. And again, like in many cases, the Braga group has shown in this case over 10 years ago, how, how, how aging of selected components, in this case, pimelic acid and this ferrocene derivative, by aging them in different vapors, vapors of protic liquids or vapors of aprotic liquids can lead to different reactivity. So we are really excited about this right now because not only we can make materials by this aging, if we have a bit of patience, but we can also direct these reactions. And maybe the same by same time learn more about how does the liquid assisted grinding works. So everybody would like to know these days, and this is a big question on mechanochemistry, how do things work? We observe a lot, we get crystal structures of materials, we observe power refraction patterns with spectroscopy. But right now, what is very much elusive is, is a complete integrated understanding of how does the mechanochemical reaction climate work? How do we understand it at the level of molecules? How do we understand it at the level of solid solid interfaces? And, and, and what are the thermodynamic driving forces behind? So, you know, one way to go about it, very exciting, six or seven years ago, uh, our team has, has uh, demonstrated the possibility to conduct real-time observation of milling reactions. In that case, using, using a very, very, very high energy X-ray uh, source at the ESRF in Grenoble, which allowed us to record movies such as, such as these. This is a real-time diffraction, X-ray diffraction movie of a mechanochemical reaction. The three lines here that I'm showing are lines of zinc oxide, which is a reactant. The little spots that come and go is the imidazole starting material, which is microcrystalline. And in the center of the slide, if you look very carefully, you will see more and more uh, clear rings appearing. This is the nascent signature of the product being observed in situ. So this is a really exciting methodology. Once this was done in uh, almost seven years ago, we were thrilled and I'm even more thrilled to see how the methodology is developing right now. Because at this point, as I mentioned, there is at least four synchrotrons in Europe who can provide this service of real-time monitoring of chemical reactions. It is not only our colleagues in Germany and Croatia that have access to this technology. There's been some really fantastic developments that happen by other groups. For example, I really need to highlight here the extensive and really, really interesting work done by the MLN group in Germany. And also very recently, a new design for monitoring mechanochemical reactions by Milik uh, developed by Nicola Cassati at Paul Scherer Institute. So these are only two examples of this very rapidly growing body of work of real-time monitoring nanochemistry. What do we get from that? What are we going to learn? That is now a completely different story, and I will leave that for, that for the future. And at this point, I would like to thank, thank you before all, uh, Dr. Martini, thank you, Dr. Matisse, thank you, Ashley, thank you, James, thank you, Noah, for coordinating all this, and, and, and thanks to NSF and the Center for Mechanical Control Reactivity. I think it is beautiful being in the field for a few years now to see this, 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 this rapid increase in supporting mechanochemistry and green chemistry through it happening on both sides of the Atlantic. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. All right, Tomislav, we want to just uh, thank you for a uh, for for a great presentation. Um, there there were a few quite a few issues with uh, getting some of the some of the questions uh, on, online. And uh, 
hopefully uh, we can uh, get some folks that can just uh, go to our website and also send us questions by email and then we'd be able to share those with you for uh, for posting uh, later uh, on the uh, on the YouTube channel. Sorry, folks, for some of the uh, upfront issues. This was our first time, so it was quite <laughs> quite exciting getting some of these things going. But also, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Thank you, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and maybe I should just highlight that if anybody wants to talk to me more about this, uh, if anybody wants to discuss things, uh, if anybody wants to suggest ideas, collaborate. If anybody wants to point me in direction of a group that I may be not aware of, please feel free to contact me either by email or on Twitter or whatever medium you find suitable. Uh, this is a really exciting time and we can all really get mechanochemistry going together. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks. Well, I hope you can join us uh, next month uh, for, our, for our second presentation in the series from, uh, from Adam Braunschweig. Uh, until then, I hope everyone has uh, a wonderful day. Thank you.